Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Today I want to talk to you about joy that perseveres. Joy that perseveres. Uh, we all know that this is the most wonderful time of the year. There's a lot of joy that goes around during this time because of what Christmas means to us believers. But how many know that it's not always that joyful for everyone? It's difficult too. And, and to be honest with you, you haven't had to go through any major crisis in your life to not feel a little drained of joy. It's been, it's been a difficult season probably for many of us. I'll be honest with you, I've talked with a lot of our people and uh, a lot of them had just been feeling completely drained of joy. And there's been a lot of strife and relational conflict and uh, other things going on in life. And, and so it's just been hard. And so it's hard to carry that joy around, isn't it? It's hard to be that. But I, I, I want to encourage you today with this message that we have a joy that perseveres through all circumstances. And it really does uh, begin with Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my mic might be a little loud. It's kind of ringing a little bit for me up here. Uh, joy is closely related to gladness and, and happiness, although joy is actually more of a state of being than it is an emotion. And it's a result of choice. And one Bible dictionary says it's a state of delight and well-being that results from knowing and serving God. Now, what I have seen in our Christmas story is that joy is rooted in the gospel. And I'm just going to read this for you, but it's Luke 2, 8 through 14. And it was the night that Jesus was born. And this is what it says. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Notice that. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Now, he doesn't stop there. He says what that joy is. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. The reason why there is joy for all people is because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was born. And Jesus brings a joy that can persevere through all circumstances, church. And the reason why is because joy comes from salvation in Christ. A joy that's not just an emotion or a temporary happiness, but a joy that can be inside of your life so that when you leave a Christmas play or you leave church, you don't have to return back into sorrow and sadness right away. I, I told the community that we can't possibly do this play every day to keep depositing joy in your life, but we can give you Jesus Christ who will go with you and be the joy of your life. And that's, that's what we want to encourage. And that's what we have been encouraging. Now, we receive this joy when we believe that Jesus Christ came to save us from our sin and to save us and deliver us and to give us eternal life. By the way, how amazing is God? I know we all know this as a church, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're new here. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. How good is it that God doesn't just save you from your sin, but he also goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to give you eternal life too. What a gift. What a gift. We don't have to just enjoy life until the day we die. We get to live forever. So we get to enjoy the joy forever. That's a gift in itself. And sometimes we can, you know, kind of miss that. Let's talk about the joy of salvation in Romans chapter 5. And we're going to have that on the screen for you here. Romans 5, and we're going to be in verse uh, 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 5, and we'll be in verse 1. And I'm doing it myself. Where does, where does joy come from? We know it comes from 
Jesus. We know it comes from our salvation. Let me explain to you, though, how we have a joy that can persevere through all trials and circumstances. Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. You know that, that we were in conflict with God because of our sin, but because of what Jesus did for us and because we believe in what Christ has done for us, we are forgiven. That means now we have a peaceful relationship with God because we're not sinners anymore. We're not identified as sinners. We're identified as saints, and we are now living at peace with God. Just so you know, peace brings joy in your life. When you have peace, you can have joy. And so when you have peace with the creator who created you, you're going to have joy as well. When you know that you're forgiven, you're going to have joy. And so let's keep going here. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. And he says in verse 3, this is interesting, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Oh my goodness. What? Did I read? My glass is working okay? We can rejoice too? When we run into problems and trials, you know, there's, there's theories and then there's practice, right? It, it, in theory, that sounds real good, Ryan. But in practice, it's hard, isn't it? And I'm sure Paul knows it's hard when he's saying this. I'm sure God knows it's hard. But guess who's, guess who's with us? Guess who's Emmanuel, God with us to help us? And right, here's what happens next, okay? So trials develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Well, that's a sermon in itself. The reason why you feel God's love is because he gives you the Holy Spirit so you feel the love of God. Thank the Lord for that. That's Emmanuel, God with us right there. So real quick, the joy of salvation. Let me explain this, this scripture here. Number one, joy is the fruit of knowing we are forgiven, loved, and at peace with God. Church, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it's, it's a fundamental, basic understanding that we have joy because we know we're forgiven. We know that we're loved, and we know that we're at peace with God. We believe that to be true. And God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He says that in verse 8 of Romans 5. There's also a real joy in knowing that we no longer have to fear death because we will have everlasting life. Or if a family member passes away that is a believer in Christ, they have everlasting life. That's why when we do our funerals here, we actually celebrate, too, those who are believers because we know that they're with God and that they're, they're in a much happier place than we are, let me tell you. It's hard at the time. It's a day of mourning and it's a day of joy as well. It's an interesting dynamic for Christians, isn't it, that we can be sad and joyful that we know where they are. Number two, joy is the fruit of knowing God's faithfulness will carry us through every trial. His faithfulness will carry you, my friends. What does it mean that we can rejoice when we go through trials? Paul says trials provide an opportunity for God to test and strengthen our faith so it will develop endurance. In other words, your faith will be able to endure. You'll have durable joy as well. Character will be developed and confidence in our future salvation in Christ. So let me explain that. Every time we go through a trial, what happens is God brings us through it, doesn't he? You know how many, you know how many trials I've been through? By the way, uh, this sermon is out of the trenches of my trials. So everything you're hearing is what I've been applying in my life, my entire life. And so just, just note that this isn't something I am 
theorizing. I'm saying this really does work. All right? This is true. So every time we go through trial, God brings us through it, developing our confidence in him, developing the character of Christ through each trial, and giving us greater faith that God will save us at the second coming of Christ. Let's not forget that Jesus already did come to the earth. Okay, I know when we, when we celebrate Christmas, you know, we kind of think about the baby Jesus a lot, right? Just a reminder, he's, he's in heaven sitting next to the throne of God. And the next thing he does, the next time we see him, he's coming to save us for the final salvation of all people from this world. Okay? Every time I go through a trial, God brings me through it. Have you noticed that in your life too? Doesn't mean you don't come out of it different. We always do. Every time I go through a trial, trial, it's a chance to develop my character and my faith in God. And every time I go through that, it strengthens my confidence that if he's going to save me through every trial, he's going to save me at the second coming. Amen? That's literally what Paul's trying to teach here. Our confidence increases that if he's saving us in this life, surely he will save you at the second coming. So praise God for that. Even James said this, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, so go through it, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. In other words, the words there means mature. Your faith matures. Your confidence matures. Now, Peter said something as well. So we got Paul, we have James, we have Peter. Peter said uh, something similar. He says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. There it is again when he comes back. You love him. Now, this is amazing. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. Wow. We don't see God, you know, in the physical right now. We have faith in him. He gets us through trials. And we're going to have inexpressible joy now and even later. I mean, that's amazing. Number three, joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we receive at salvation. But of course, guess what it does? It grows as we grow in faith and in trials. So your, your, your joy can actually grow. The fruit of the Holy Spirit can grow. But it's going to take you to go through some things and see God deliver you and get you through it so your joy can be stronger. I wish there was another way, don't you? That would be nice. Jesus called the Holy Spirit our comforter and counselor in John 14, 26. Joy is knowing that the comforter and counselor is with us. He's in us. His spirit lives in us. Strengthening and leading us through trials and times of grief. Church, I don't know how to explain it either, except when I've been through times of grief or trials, I have felt the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And he has brought me so much joy. Remembering this truth, holding on to this truth, is how we remain joyful and persevere through any circumstance. But you may be saying, Pastor Ryan, I don't know, brother. What do I do if I haven't been joyful or if I've been running out of joy? What do I do? Well, that's why I want to I concentrate on that for the rest of this message. What do I do? I'm going to tell you what I've done. And just so you know, 
that uh, if you've been going through a loss of a loved one or through some kind of struggle or crisis, it's okay if you're not joyful. God's not saying, hey, you have to be joyful. We can all express our emotions of mourning and sadness and sorrow. That is okay. That's normal. In fact, the Bible says there's a time for grief and sorrow and there's a time for joy. And the Bible says to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. So he doesn't want you to ignore your feelings or ignore your emotions. What he does want you to know is he is with you to get you through it. Secondly, though, we could be running out of joy. We may not be feeling the joy because our connection to the source of joy is off. Or we're not doing the things that God said to do to bring joy in our lives. Maybe we're doing things that are actually hurting us instead of helping us. And I've been guilty of that. And so let me share with you what I've gotten. These are scriptures, okay, from my time in the Word of God during my trials. So you're going to get a little look at my life. And I'm telling you what I mean. When I'm, I've been a pastor for 16 years. Um, that can bring some trials. <laughs> and going through trials with you to help you get through them. Now, my wife has not been a trial in my life at all. My wife has been a blessing. So for me, my marriage hasn't been a trial, but maybe yours has. Maybe there's a family strife. Maybe there's a relationship thing. Maybe there is a loss of a loved one. When I lost my cousin, my cousin Gary, I had questions for God because we prayed for miracles and healings and it didn't come. You know, it was hard, right? We've been through some things, haven't we? All of us. We've been through some things. I'm telling you, what I'm going to give you today is what God has shown me in tears. That has brought joy. And so, number one, joy comes from our pursuit and praise of God in time of need. Joy comes from our pursuit and praise of God in time of need. Psalm 34, 4 through 8 says this, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be what? Is it up there? Will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Now, right away, I can already hear you guys putting out your questions. Well, Ryan, I've done that. Well, I got to tell you, I have too, and it didn't work the first time. It didn't work the second time. It didn't work the third time. It worked when I let it work. And it worked when I kept going to God. It's not going to be a quick fix. Some of the stuff you're carrying is so big and so heavy, it's going to take more than just 10 minutes with God. It's going to take tarrying with God for a while. Like take off the day. Take off from work. Get on your face before God and seek him. Now, just so you know, the verses before this, it started off with praising God. Even in the midst of your trial, praise God. You can read it for yourself. The first, four, uh, first three verses was praising God, giving him worship. So that's what helps us get into that. What about Psalm 30, 8 through 12? I cried out to you, O Lord. I begged the Lord for mercy, saying, what will you gain if I die? Isn't that a good question? What will you gain if I die? If I sink into the grave, can my dust praise you? Can it tell of your faithfulness? Rhetorical questions, right? <laughs> but kind of good questions. Hear me, Lord, and have mercy on me. Help me, O oh Lord. And then all of a sudden, it says in verse 11, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The Lord is close to those who call upon his name. 
And, you know, sometimes we're, we're hurting so much that we can't even worship. We're, look what he says here. And that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. Let me tell you, sometimes your grief, your sorrow, your trial will be so heavy, you have a hard time worshiping. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Push through and worship him. He inhabits the praises of his people. Push through. Psalm 43, 4 through 5. There I will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all my joy. I will praise you with my harp, O God, my God. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. The psalmist David, he's been through some stuff too, hasn't he? This is how he restored his joy. This is how he got joy flowing back in his life is he went to God and pursued him in time of need and he praised him and joy began to overflow in his life again. The source of all joy is God. So why would we not run to him? Number two, joy comes from repenting of sin that has become a barrier between us and God. So I'm, I'm going to turn to a different uh, aspect of, of, of where joy can come from. I just, just so you know that sin can be so heavy in our life, so guilty feeling that we don't feel joy. And to be honest with you, you probably shouldn't. You know what I'm saying? We, we probably shouldn't feel joy if we're living in, in habitual sin unrepentant sin, we should feel grief and sorrow for that so that we will turn to God and apologize and repent and turn away from that sin because this is what David says in Psalm 51, restore the joy of my salvation. But he asked that when he began to confess and ask for forgiveness for his sins. Sin keep, keeps us from feeling the peace that we have with God, therefore we don't have joy. When we remove sin out of our lives, when we remove that, that shame and that guilt, and we know that God forgives us, joy comes uh, just rushing back into our lives. And so I just want to encourage you that if you've been living in an unrepentant lifestyle, you will struggle to feel joy today. And it's so key that you have peace with God in your hearts and that you turn back to him and remove that barrier that's keeping joy from flowing in your life. And one of the best things you can do is confess to a brother or sister in Christ that you trust that will be there for you, that won't, that won't spread your news, that won't gossip about it, but that they will, they will keep it with you and they'll pray with you. Confess your sins to one another. That's what the word says. And it will bring great joy. It will into your life. I don't have time to read through uh, Psalm 51, but please do. If you're struggling with uh, feeling joy, maybe you've been living in something in a sin that you shouldn't be, God will bring joy back in when we repent and turn. Number three, joy comes from following and obeying God's word. Psalm 1, 1 through 2. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight, the joy of those is those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Let me read the next scripture for you to help you before I explain. Psalm 19, 8. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Wow. If we follow the word of God and we obey it, it brings joy into our lives. We all know that, right? Maybe sometimes we don't realize, though, that if we follow the way of the wicked or we join in with sin, we don't realize that we, are, we don't feel that joy anymore. And to be honest with you, the Word of God is insight for living and, and guides us into all paths of peace. So, of course, we would have joy if we do what it says. And so... Going back to number two, if I'm reading the word of God and it says repent, man, if I repent, that joy will come flowing back into my life again. 
So I better do what the Word says. And then I'm going to share a few other things that we can do here before we close what the, what the Word of God says to do. Well, wait a minute. The Word of God says to run to God in time of need. If I do what that says, joy will come flowing back in my life. It's pretty simple, isn't it? But to be intentional in, in applying the Word of God so that we can experience joy flowing in our lives again. Number four, I've seen in Scripture that joy comes from waiting and being in the presence of God. Now, I wanted to put that in the beginning as well with pursuits and praise. But there's just some times where you just need to wait on the Lord. Like I said, take off, take the day off, and be with God, all right? So waiting on the Lord and being in his presence, you will experience the joy of the Lord. Now, Ryan, do you have proof of that? Yeah, I got scripture and then my own life. Psalm 16, 8 through 11. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. In other words, there's an awareness of God's presence. When you wait long enough to notice God working, when you praise him, when you give him your burdens, when you confess your sins and repent, when you do what the word of God says, and now you wait in the, in the presence of the Lord, you will be glad because you know he's there. You know that the presence of God is joy, right? It's peace. It's love. Uh, I love what ESV version says, I have set the Lord always before me. Think about that for a second. I put God in front of me instead of my problems. I put God in front of me instead of my trials. I put God in front of me instead of the slander being, being thrown at me. I put God in front of me instead of my worries. I put God in front of me instead of this world. Church, we must do this to see joy flow back into our lives. We put our eyes on so many things, so many problems, but if we set the Lord before us always, we will experience joy. It says, no wonder I rejoice. No wonder I am glad because God is with me. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> And then verse 10 is actually a prophecy about Jesus as well, that David prophesied. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. That's referring to Jesus dying and then he resurrects. Okay? For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. So not only will you have everlasting life, but you have it because Jesus doesn't rot in the grave. He comes out and resurrects. That promise should be bring joy to us. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. See, again, if we set these promises before us, it brings joy back into our lives. We know, all know Isaiah 40, 31, right? Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Uh, just so you know that one of God's ways of strengthening us is by giving us his joy. His joy. The joy of the Lord is our? Now, there's strength because there's, there's, tr there's struggles. There's trials. But his strength helps us have joy in the midst of them. And lastly, number five, joy comes from blessing those around us. This is more practical than all the other ones you heard. Now, for me personally, um, I, as a pastor, I'm called to serve. You know, we're kind of on call all the time. And, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes we go through things and no one knows. You know, no one knows what we go through. I don't know all the things you go through. You know, we don't really know that, do we? So it's important that we're kind to each other at all times, isn't it? Because we don't know what we're going through. But I have to say, um, when I've been going through some things, um, and I get an opportunity to help other people, you know what happens? My mind 
my mind gets off my problems and I, I start to feel joy for helping other people. It sounds like you guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? And that's in Scripture everywhere. And so it's interesting. Like, I forget about my problems when I help other people with their problems. Or I look at their problems and I go, man, I guess I've been, I've been sad for no reason. Their, their thing is much greater than mine. Not that I want to compare, but it just, it's just the way it is. You know? I've been in a pity party. No offense. It's sometimes you can. Sometimes you need to be sad about what's happening around you. But I was in a pity party, and they're going through much worse. And so, you know, my calling gives me the opportunity. Um, but even if I wasn't a pastor, this scripture is true. Listen, listen to Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I have learned that as I refresh other people, I am refreshed and God fills me with joy again. And by the way, church, can I, do, can I, can I ask you to do something? Refresh those who are always refreshing people. Like when you, when you blessed us during pastor appreciation, that was such a blessing. You know, we're, we're constantly as pastors refreshing people. It's always, it's amazing to be refreshed. And let me tell you, there are people in this church who are refreshing people all the time. Don't think that they don't need refreshment though. Just because someone's happy doesn't mean they don't need some refreshing as well. I love, I love blessing those who refresh. And it keeps them going, right? So and be there for someone, encourage someone, help someone, and you will be refreshed. Psalm 141, oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor, the Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. When you're kind to the poor, when you're helpful to those in trouble, guess who rescues you? The Lord. Proverbs 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down, but an encouraging word cheers a person up. Church, your encouragement was made for times as these right now in this world. Philippians 1, 4 through 5. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Why? Why did Paul pray with joy? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. There is something about working together, being there for one another, that joy just flows in your life. Uh, I want to encourage you to, in other words, share the joy. Share the joy. Even, even when you're going through things in your life, consider sharing the joy. And my goodness, when we're not going through something, make sure we're encouraging one another because people need it. We need it right now. Amen? You know, it's interesting. When we don't take time to refresh and encourage others, there's a lack of joy being shared. And so someone needs that. And I, here's, here's, where, here's what I think the devil does. I think the devil tries to get us all discouraged so there's a lack and void of encouragement going around in the house of God. That's spiritual warfare in itself, right? Let's get everyone in the church, every Christian discouraged so there isn't any kind of encouragement. Now, God forgive us if we're not all discouraged and we're not encouraging each other. That's just wrong. And by the way, we as Christians need to do a better job of seeing things, seeing the good in people first. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> There's a lot of great things that God is doing in people's lives. There's a lot of encouragement we could be giving. We need to find the good in each other and encourage one another, right? But man, you know what? The devil wants all of us to be in despair. So when we get in the presence of God, we're going to put on clothes of joy instead. <clears throat> when, we, when we do these things that the scriptures say, <clears throat> we're going to have joy to pass around to everyone around us. Amen? Um, let me tell you something real quick. Let me get a couple, or a drink of water here. <clears throat> uh, you know what I love doing? I love buying a pack of cards. Just go to Walmart, whatever. I like getting a 10-pack of cards, whatever I can get. I like to take time to thank people in my life. Do you know by the time I'm done writing those cards, there's a whole different attitude in my life? Do you know why? Because I dwelled for however long it takes, and sometimes it takes a while, 
because I'll pray, I'll think about what to say. Uh, by the time I'm done, I put my mind on things that are praiseworthy. And that's what Philippians 4.8 says to do. You change your mindset by doing what God says to do. And by the time you're done, you feel joy. And I'm admitting that sometimes it feels like joy runs out. But let us all know this for sure, okay? God doesn't run out of joy. His source of joy is everlasting. If we're not feeling the joy, it just simply means that we need to reconnect to the source of joy. I mean, that's probably your takeaway for the day right there, but I got a few right now. Here we go. Number one, silence the noise of your trials by praising God. Church, please do not let your trials be louder than your God and your praise for God. I mean, I, I'm, right now I'm going to say I didn't write this down. Let me tell you right now. Sometimes we'll talk about the trial so much and never talk to God. We'll talk about the trial so much and never praise God in the trial. The Word of God says to praise Him in the trial. To praise Him. To rejoice. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> Just so you know, the devil wants you to talk all about the trial. He wants you to talk about it with others and, and gossip a lot. He, just so you know, you're allowed to go to people to carry each other's burdens, right? So we should do that. But if your trial is causing you to sin, don't be talking about it. Okay? Let's praise God instead, right? And then let's seek counsel and help from other believers to pray with us and praise God through it. And to really address the need, because it's okay to do that. We need each other as the believers, as believers in God, but let's not let it go down the wrong path either. Number two, restore the flow of God's presence. We're doing a little review. Restore the flow of God's presence by removing the sin that has become a barrier. Okay? I'm telling you right now, when you confess your sins to the Lord, he will flow that joy right back in. Forsake sinful patterns and obey God's word that leads to joy. The word of God, if we do what it says, it, it blesses us. Four, trade the weight of your trials by waiting in the presence of God. Your trials are so heavy, but God's presence is greater. And then lastly, turn from focusing on self to bringing joy and encouragement to others. It's so good to do that. Hey, uh, I actually am wrong. There's one more thing. Sometimes you just have to choose joy. And I choose joy when I dwell with God and do the will of God by blessing others and loving others. Sometimes you just have to choose joy. You really do. What I've shared with you today are not theories. They're from my own life. They are from the trials of, of, of the trenches of my trials. They're from uh, so much in my life. And God's word works if you work it. And he wants to flow joy back into your life. Do you believe that? Yeah. you believe it? Yeah. I want to encourage you to apply this message today. And I'm telling you, for me personally, it really began with me getting with God alone and then even confiding in other believers to help me carry these things and just let God work. And then finding ways to bless others during this season. I want to encourage you to do that. Go buy some cards. Uh, sign up for Share the Joy and help a family with gifts. Do whatever you got to do to switch your mindset on all the praiseworthy and good things God's doing in your life. Amen. Why don't we pray and then Dorothy's going to come out and give us a few things to know. Lord, we thank you that you're the source of all our joy. And your joy never runs out. And God, we, we get disconnected. God, we're running back to you today. And God, we go through things and we've been through some things. And it's okay to mourn. It's okay to be sorrowful and sad. But God, we don't want to live in that all the time. So God, we run to your presence. We run to you, Lord. God, I pray that we as a church would be careful to encourage one another, to refresh and bring a cheerful word to one another. Lord, we thank you that your joy came into this world, a joy that helps us persevere through all things and all circumstances. Lord, we want to feel and experience that joy. 
God, I pray you restore the joy of your salvation. Restore the joy flow in our lives. And we choose joy. We choose to be in your presence. We choose to praise you in the midst of our storms. We choose to do your will by blessing and loving others. I thank you for this church. It's been a blessing to my life. And it's been a blessing to serve them. Help us to continue to do that, Lord. We give you all this, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you.